as Joanna Evangelista read that first reading, you could sense a sense of joy, a sense of gratitude as Paul writes this letter to the people, to the churches of Philippi. Here were people who were concerned about Paul when he was in prison. They were concerned about his physical well-being. They were concerned about his spiritual well-being. And they sent him help. Just last Sunday, we heard the letter of Paul to Timothy, actually, while he was in the prison in Rome. And the letter and the tone of that, I mean, the tone of that letter was so different. Paul was despondent. The Christians in Rome did not come to visit him. They ignored him. Here now, Paul has got a sense of gratitude. He thanks them. The church at Philippi was very dear to Paul. When he was over there, the people united with him as he gave witness to Jesus Christ, as he preached the kingdom of God. But now that Paul was taken away from him, rumors kept on reaching Paul through people that he knew that the church was gradually disintegrating. Whether the pressure had come from within because of internal struggles with one another or the pressure came from outside, the persecutions from, out, from outside, we really don't know, but Paul is writing to them. He first writes in gratitude, but he makes this desperate plea, be united for goodness sake, and carry out and bring to fulfill, fulfillment the wonderful work that was started in you. That work was started in Christ and through Christ. It's remarkable. Paul was the one who did the work but he never for once took glory, never for once took pride in saying, I am the one. Quite the contrary, it was always in Christ and through Christ. And he speaks about this particular knowledge, this knowledge and insight that everything begins with Christ and through Christ would be the knowledge that would bind them together as one. In fact, most of his letters, Paul would keep on saying that, oh, to know and to understand, to feel the height and the breadth, the love and the depth of the love of Jesus Christ. If we only knew that it was Christ that began all this work, then we would have no problem in being one, one with one another and one with Christ. As I said, you read this letter and you come with a sense of joy, you come with a sense of lightness in your step because of Paul's letter. When we come to the gospel, quite on the contrary, it just seems to be clashes and chaos. Jesus is struggling with the Pharisees and the scribes. It is not the first time, it won't be the last time. And it is about the Sabbath. It is not that they had any difficulty about observance of the Sabbath. Both the Pharisees and Jesus agreed that the Sabbath should be kept, the laws of God should be kept, the laws of the traditions of the people of Israel should be kept. Jesus would say that in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. I have not come to abolish the law, but I have come to fulfill it. So where did they clash? They clashed about how the Sabbath was to be observed. On the Sabbath there was supposed to be no manual work whatsoever. And healing was considered to be one of the works that was manual work. You could always come on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday if you had something to be treated for. You don't need to come unless it was an emergency. And this did not qualify to be as emergency. The man had dropped to yesterday, probably had it a couple of years ago, and he could always come on another day. But Jesus was trying to bring home to them a lesson. The laws that they had observed was to serve, or the laws that they were to observe were to serve a purpose. Once they kept the laws, they would have more time, more time to pray, more time to be concerned about one another, more time to come closer to God. But these quibblings and these quarrels that Jesus had with the scribes and Pharisees still continues with us today. But now, in 2010, we still have the same problems. We argue and quarrel about certain laws and commands. In Lent, we wonder whether we break the fast if we eat two slices of bread rather than one slice of bread. 
I know a friend of mine who said that she had ordered a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, and he was halfway through it when she found that it was a Friday in Lent. She spat it out and threw the rest of the sandwich. Another one told me, she said, well, I come and stay at the back of the church and so that I can, eat, I can be the last one because 59 minutes ago I ate and I might break the one hour of fasting before. It's not that these laws are not important, but if we are so caught up with the laws, then we forget the purpose, and the purpose is to come closer to God. They are supposed to let us free and keep us free in order to do that. And so we ask the good Lord to help us to open our minds, as Jesus said, in, as Paul said in that letter to the Philippians, the knowledge and the insight of the love of Christ will help us to observe these laws and to carry them out. And we can taste and see the concern that Jesus had for the people of his own time, especially the poor, the needy, the lame, and the crippled in the streets, and he has that same concern for you and me today. God bless you all. Join me now as we pray together. For the people of God called to tender, loving care of the whole human family, we pray to the Lord. For an openness of mind and heart among the world's nations and religious traditions, we pray to the Lord. For the sick, for all of you who have written in asking for prayers, for those undergoing surgery today, for those who have died during the night, for those suffering from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, from dropsy, from muscular dystrophy, we pray to the Lord. For hearts filled with gratitude and generosity as we come towards the end of this year and we get into the season of Advent, we pray to the Lord. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts that you have given us and we ask you to keep us mindful always that people always come first. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Amen. Lord God, be pleased to accept these gifts that we offer to you with humble and with contrite hearts. My sisters, my brothers, let us pray that this our sacrifice be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, may this holy offering bring us your blessing and accomplish within us its promise of salvation. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. In love you created us, in justice you condemned us, but in mercy you redeemed us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him the angels and all the choirs of heaven worship in awe before your presence. May our voices be one with theirs. As they sing with joy the hymn of your glory, we join them as we sing.
Father, you are holy indeed, and all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you. Through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the working of the Holy Spirit. From age to age you gather a people to yourself, so that from east to west a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. And so, Father, we bring you these gifts. We ask you to make them holy by the power of your Spirit, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our...